So just to review a little bit the SPSS output. Uh, when we run the multiple regression, it looks very much like this, the thing we did before. It's just that we have more x variables here. So the name of the variable will come up in a list here in the coefficient estimates. And then you have the estimated coefficients down here, like before. Um, so those are what we call bi in theory. These are the, the basic f estimates. And these are the standard deviations of the estimates. And then there's uh, the beta column we can ignore. But the T column here is about some tests, which I will explain very soon. And the significance here is, is uh, what we call the standard test. It's about, um, I mean, it's a basic measure of whether these variables impact the price in this case uh, significantly. And then over here, you have the confidence intervals from the, for the coefficients. And then up here, R squares, I will discuss a little bit, and these square sums that we will see. basically here. Um, talk about inference and testing. So you have this standard test. So you remember the model says y is assumed to be maybe a linear function of two or more x variables. Um, and then we always want to test whether these beta i's are different from zero. So this is what we call the standard test. Can we reject these hypotheses in favor of this one? This is what we say. We measure the significance of, say, x1 and x2 variables. So, and we want to see those p-values less than 0 0.05, basically, for all our variables. Um, <coughs> so this is the standard test, and this is what we normally would do. And of course, in, in science, it will be also sometimes relevant to, to test other values for these parameters. So. For instance, a beta i, it could be relevant to test whether it's greater than 1 or equal to 1 or something. So you should remember that these coefficients, they will normally have some economic interpretations. Uh, so it could be price elasticities for one thing or any other economic quantity. And it might be relevant to test any claim value for them. And second part of inference. Inference is basically <coughs> testing and confidence intervals. So we get confidence intervals. They usually come as an estimate and then plus minus some factor, this time from the t distribution and uh, times the standard deviation of the estimate, like this. <coughs> yeah, so uh, I'll put here. So 
you have bi plus minus t alpha half with some degrees of freedom. It happens to be n minus k minus 1, where k is the number of x variables, and then times sbi. That's the, f the confidence interval. So if you look at um, the impact of the driven distance in this model, for instance, the estimate is like this, minus 0 0.78. And we have a 95% confidence interval, and the degrees of freedom is quite high. So n minus k minus 1 is way above 30. It means the t distribution is more or less equal to the, st the standard normal distribution. So the t 0 0.025 will be close to 1.96, which is close to 2. So in general, if I take my estimate plus minus two times this standard deviation, I will be very close to the confidence interval here. So usually w when people report regression output, they very often just give the coefficients and then the standard deviations here. And then people will know that if I take this plus minus two times this, I have the 95% uh, confidence interval. Yeah, so you can figure out that this is more or less equal to that one plus two times this one and so on. Yeah. Okay. So that's inference. It's it's the same actually story as we did done before. It's the only thing is that there are no more than more than one x variable, and things are a little bit complicated because these x variables tend to affect each other. But otherwise, the principles are the same. Yeah. We still have something we call uh, splitting of variation. So you have your y data here, y1, y2, y3, y, and then x1, 1, 1, x1, 2, <coughs> one, three. X, k, one. So you have a sort of a matrix of data, you have one dependent variable and then a set of independent variables. Um, the splitting of variation is uh, designed to measure how well we can explain the variation of our y variable with the x variables, basically. So we have something called the, the square sum for total variation, which only depends on y. And then we have um, the two sources of variation which we can split is uh, as much as possible. We want to attribute to these variables together. We call that SSR. And then the remaining part will be called uh, just uh, random. So it's the square sum of error. And I don't like this word error actually because it's very difficult to pronounce it in uh, English it just comes out error so but a square sum of error so something like that so the thing to note here is that the SST is only depending on the Y data so there's nothing we can do about that but we want to choose the, the estimated model that makes the SSR as large as possible. So that's the same as minimizing the SSC. So the least square sum method seeks to minimize this one. Okay. And 
then we dive right into the R square, which is the same as before. So it's just the amount of variation. Um, it's S S R over S S T. So we just see how much can we explain uh, as a fraction of how much there is in total. So this is SSR over SST. And then you will note when we do multiple regression, there's an alternative R square, which is very often used. It calls the R square adjusted. And to just tell you basically what it is, um, it's easiest to see if we rewrite the, the original R square as this. So since. Um, this. Clearly the SSR, it must be the difference between the total and the error square sum. So we can write it like this. And then you see that an alternative form of the R square is just 1 minus SSE over SST. So these are equivalent definitions. In some statistics books, this is actually the definition of the R square. Um, the R square adjusted is just a slight variant, actually. So it just takes this form here. And it tries to modify it a little bit by just multiplying here with n minus 1 over n minus k minus 1. So just for an example, if you have 100 observations and you have four x variables, then this will be 1 minus SSE over SST times 99 over 95. So we are subtracting a little bit more from this one here just to sort of pay the price of having a larger number of x variables. So these are usually not very different. But the, the I mean, in theory, this one is considered a slightly better choice. So the problem with the, the straight r square, you can say, is that whatever garbage you throw into your model, the straight r square will always increase a little bit. Whereas this one tend to only increase when you, when you throw in some additional significant variable to the model. But if you look at our outputs, you will see that these two figures are very rarely different in any substantial way. So this is also a topic that is just coming along with um, as before. So I hope this is clear that one very important uh, use of Regression is, of course, to forecast. So you want to estimate a model for the prices of used cars, maybe basically to have something that can help you forecast prices of cars that you haven't already sold, for instance. Additionally, you want, of course, to understand the, the market for used cars. But at least if you're in the business, you would like to forecast prices. So you 
your estimated model will always look something like this. 47 plus 3.2 x1 plus 9.7 times x2 minus 1.1 times x3. So this is your particular estimated model. And if x1 is 2, x2 is 3, and x3 is 7, you can just insert these x values into the model, and you get some forecasts given these x values, right? The very relevant question is, suppose I get Y star equal to 271,000 for a car. Um, what are the margin of error in that estimate? And this is, again, deeply related to this SE estimate, which in this case comes out uh, like this. If you remember from the single variable, it was square root of SSE over n minus 2. And now you see the more general formula. It's just square root of SSE <coughs> over n minus k minus 1. And k always is the number of x variables. So if you have like four x variables, you get is e over n minus 5. So it's just a modification again of the previous formula. And supposing our sample is not too small, we would just use as a rule of thumb set alpha half times this estimate as uh, 1 minus alpha forecast error. So if we want 90% margin, then 1 minus alpha should be 0 0.90. So alpha should be 0 0.10. And then alpha half, of course, 0, 0.0. 0 0.05, so set is this, and you can check this, but you probably remember this is something like 1.64. And then we have this even more common rule that for the 95%, you would get this 1.96, so we use plus minus 2 as the approximation. So for a f we, when you do regression and you use it for a f in a forecast sense, you get very used to just looking at um, this number up here. This is the SE estimate. And it means to me that this model has a predictive force or it has a margin of error at, at about two times this, so it's about 20,000 um, on the 95% level. And you see that's a quite small margin of error when you want, want to estimate the price of a car. And it's very related to the R square, which is here basically 0 0.99. So it's a very strong forecast model in this case. And 
see the other model here where I kicked out one of the x variables. Here I only used um, uh, yeah I kicked out the age. Um, and I get only r square about 0 0.90. You see the adjusted r square is basically the same, but the standard error now. 27, so two times this is something like 55,000. So I lose a lot in forecast power when I kick out that important variable. So you have to work with this and get used to this, but you can note something interesting here. If you look at this model here, down here, you have only the price of the car when it was new and the driven distance, so the mileage, and they are both coming out as very significant variables. So their p-values is zero, and the t-statistics are very high, or high and very low, I would say. Um, if you look at this model where we have um, The three variables, they are still all significant. But you can see somehow that the T statistic for the mileage is now is still quite low, but it's reduced a bit. So now the effect is mainly that of the age here in this forest. <coughs> yeah. time yeah we have some time left Basically, the rest of this uh, course is going to be a lot about this topic, actually, what we call model building. Um, so we're going to have data like this. Yeah, it's a bit boring to write this, but OK. So we have our y variable and some x variables. And we want to see how this variable depends on these guys. So there are two major questions relating to what we call model building. And the first one is the structure. So, so far, we are only looking at linear models, meaning this is my structure. But in real life, we, we, we know that sometimes things are not linear. They can be of different forms. They can be exponential forms, poly polynomials and stuff. So one of the issues regarding structure is um, to sort of put up the, the theoretical form of this relation. So and the second part of the model building is then to say, OK, I think it's a linear function. It should be by theory. And then which of these x variables am I going to use in this model? So the first one is theoretical, and the second one is more practical using the, the data. So if it's a demand model with my y, demand and x i are 
invoices. So you run an airline from on a particular link and you have your own prices and you have competing services prices, x1, x2 and x3. Then theory dictates a model of the type Basically, something like this. And for those of you who deal with economics, you will realize that these guys or these parameters are now price elasticities. I'm going to talk about that probably next week or the week after. We're going to learn how to take something nasty as this and transform it into looking like a beautiful linear model again so we can estimate these parameters using what we are learning today. Um, so this is the theory telling us that this is how it should look. And then we look at our data which says that maybe this price of train on the same link does not really impact the demand for airlines. So this variable should be eliminated from my model. So my model really looks like this. So this is what we call model building, right? Yeah, so I think I'm not yeah, I'm closing up the story soon. I'm going to show you something called a stepwise regression because this this uh, model building procedure is quite um, can be a quite tiring process actually if you have like six, seven linear variables that you want to include. And you want to test these five, and then this one was not significant. Uh, so let's take this one out, and then something happens with the other four. When you have correlation between this, they all affect each other. So you're going to rea realize it's, it's a difficult job to just do this, um, this uh, thing here. So when you decide on the theoretical form, you still have some work to do. And then there's something called stepwise regression, which helps us in that uh, operation. So let's have a look at that. That's our final thing today. So what we do is basically in a series of steps. And this is running all automatic in SPSS. So we just select this bunch of variables. And then SPSS does the job for us. So what it does is basically first first try a model with only one x variable. And then it will select the one single x variable that does the most contribution to r squared. So we just see, OK, here are t 10 next variables. And I want number 3 because it explains most of the variation, right? So then x, OK. And this is my first model. And then I keep x3 and I try, OK, who's the next variable that's going to contribute most to increasing the r square? So in each step, you just choose the new x variable that gives the largest increase in the r square. So maybe in the second step, number x5 was chosen. So you get this. And then maybe a few more steps. and. x1 comes in, and you might end up here and then realizing that if I now 
put in X2, X4, X6, and so on, none of them will produce any more uh, significant explanatory power. And then I just stop. I'm happy. I don't need any of the other X variables. So I have my sort of chosen model here. So it's kind of a competition between the original one, two, three, up to k x variables. And they all dream to be in the model, but they have to produce some increase in the r square when they are tested. And if they cannot do that, they will not be allowed. So I have yeah, this little example. Um, it's done on a very fairly transparent data set, this flat prices data. Um, so we're going to work on this data material a bit in the coming weeks, because it's a very nice playground for various techniques in regression. But you realize that this data set, it also includes some nominal variables. For instance, there's a town distinction between Molde, Kristiansund, and, and Olsund. So we cannot, at the moment, treat that information here. So nominal variables is not for us yet. And we have some ordinal variables, which only maybe have few values like this, we should also be a bit careful with that. But let's just take it as an exercise and see what happens. So I'm going to start now to say that y is going to be the price of flats. x1 is going to be, and this one I know it's going to be the most important factor, the, the, the floor space area. Then I'm more uncertain about the other ones here. For instance, the rent, which is the fixed cost per month. X3 would be, oh, sorry. OK, I should follow the list as it's put up here, basically. So let's see. It's a number of rooms. One, two, three, four, and so on. X3 is the location, which is some kind of grading from zero to up to somewhere. Where a higher value means a better location with a view and stuff. Then X4 is the age. X5 is the rent, which I explain as the fixed cost per month. And then there's an X6, which is the distance to the center. Which is in kilometers. So then we have, instead of sitting and playing with the, the um, massive number of different possible models here, we try to run this stepwise procedure. And we will see that SPSS will pick out only these four variables, the area, the rent, the distance, and the location, and in that order. So we, you sort of rank the, the importance of them. And then you can track the process so you see how the R square increases. And at the same time, the error margin given by this one uh, decreases. And we will end up with a margin of error at 95% at about 110,000. And this will be better, of course, than using only the area, because then the margin of error would be 176,000. And SPSS will give us a list of the other variables and show that it does not contribute to the explanatory power. So let's see. In 
living action. So these are the data, and we are going to use area, the number of rooms. Um, uh, this variable here is called situated. That's a flat location, so it's scaled from 0 to 10. Uh, the distance to center, the age, and the fixed cost here. So we go as before. Linear regression price is dependent. And then yeah. this one, this one, yeah. and first the number of rooms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in this three, maybe it's possible to. Did I get all of them? Yeah. And then the only thing that you basically do here is you change the method here. I could, I can do this first. If we run enter as the method, it will give me the estimation with all of the six variables. So let's do that first. So, and then I'm going to write here just to track the thing. Yeah. Full model means I'm using all six variables. Right. So what do you get if you look at the R square adjusted, for instance? SE is about, I would say, 55. So we take two times that. We get 110,000 for the margin of error, right? But look at the standard test here now, or look at the p values from the standard test. Here it says 0 0.15. That's not good. That means I cannot reject. I mean, let me not write it. Let me just say it. I cannot reject the hypothesis saying that the coefficient of the number of rooms is 0. And likewise, the age comes out with a p-value at 0 0.5. So it's not particularly low. So this tells me there is no significant evidence of an effect of the number of rooms or the age of the flats in this price formation. Otherwise, I see 0, 0, 0, 0. So it looks like some of these variables contribute. Of course, some do, because we have this high R square. But it also appears that some of them don't. So let's try this uh, selec selection procedure. So we go back, linear regression, and I will only change the method to stepwise. Um, and click OK. And then you get a fairly substantial amount of output. Let me come back to it. So forget about this first part, but the model summary is where you have the R squares and the, the SE stuff. So so what you see, it, it goes through. Well, let's look at the top anyway. It's here you see step model one, two, three, four variables entered. 
first this, the size in square meters, which we guessed. Then second most important is the fixed cost. Thirdly, the distance to town center. And finally, the flat location. So there are four steps in this pro procedure here. And you see the R square starting from about 90%, then to 93, 95, and 96%. And then none of the other variables are able to increase this in any substantial way. And you see the forecast error goes down in a similar way from 88 in the first model to down to 55 in the, in the final model. So four x variables were chosen. And the notable thing here is that the R square is just exactly the same as for the full model, right? And the SE is also the same. I mean, this, this output is very heavy. So here is the ANOVA table for all of these four models. So you get the, R, the RSS or SSR and the SSC and stuff for all of these four models. So it's a bit heavy. But more interestingly is the coefficient output. So here you see the models evolve. And this is the final model here. And this is exactly the same thing that you would get if I run the enter method with only those four chosen variables. So that's what you might want to do in the end if you care. Let's do that. You run analyze linear regression. And we kick out the age. And we kick out number of rooms, and then run enter. And you're going to get exactly what you find in the final step of the, re the stepwise regression. Um, So let's let's just compare what's uh, what's one difference between um, one very interesting or important thing to note here is uh, this estimate here. This is the coefficient uh, for the square meter size of the flat. So that's what we would call the marginal square meter price, right? Um, so estimated. Um, this is what we call SP1. This is the standard deviation of the estimate. So this basically the estimation. error. So we try to estimate the square meter price, but we make an estimation error on, on this. And that's measured by this number here. Now if you look at the number here, it's about 0 0.42. So let me call SP1 here 0 0.42. So if you take plus minus 2 times that, you're close to 1,000 plus minus in the estimation of the square meter price. Now look at the same number when we go to this refined model here. It's down here, 0 0.17.
That's a huge difference in, uh, in the precision of the estimate. It's more than twice the, the margin of error up here. Why is this happening? Well, it happens because basically, you know, at least I have done uh, rocket science research on this question, but my very qualified guess is that because here you have the square meter size and you have the number of rooms in the same model. And those two should be very correlated. Right. So when we throw the both of them in, we see that, OK, this thing is not really even significant, but it's heavily correlated to this other thing. So it's the only thing it does here is to disturb the estimation of the coefficient here. So some of the square meter size effect is thrown onto this room variable, and you lose precision here. So when we kick out these two, we actually improve the estimates of the other variables. OK. Yeah, that's a heavy tail on a Tuesday evening. But do the exercises, then you will uh, get more of this under your skin.